Yeah, the girls were sipping hot cocoa from big steaming cups, and as they chatted across the mass of bluebells, the clock in St. Benignus Church struck the hour of noon. <clears throat> Did her ladyship open the letter her own self? inquired Sally. To address to her, for I read the words myself as I came along. It said, Lady Rachel Zoyland, care of John Gird Esquire, Gladstonbury, Somerset. It didn't say our street, and it didn't say our number. It said Esquire. Be our mayor really an Esquire, Tossy? Do you reckon? Now he be a worshipful? Read it. I should say, who didn't read it, cried Tossy. Not with Mrs. watching she and smiling kind of patronizing all the while. No, Sally Jones, no, you simple Sal. Her took Shields led her up to her bedroom. Same as you nor me might have done, and she slammed her door and locked it too. Bless her pretty heart. She be a one, she be a one, Sal, and no mistake about it. Have you, whispered Sally gravely, leaning forward till the broad brim of her straw hat overshadowed the table. Tossie put down her cup and nodded emphatically, her eyes gleaming. Told she yesterday, he, she replied. She were helping I in kitchen and she talked so natural like that I just up and told her. I didn't mention no names, you understand. But I told her he weren't no marrying man, nor never would be. I told her he, he were a gentleman. And you should have seen the face she made at that. There have been a kind of trouble toss down our way, threw in Sally. I always knew twould never let last between Red and Miss Crummy. I tell you so, didn't I, time and again? Red to be a working man, though tis true he bain't a common man. But Miss Crummy be quite different. She isn't a lady. We know that. But she's different from Red. They weren't engaged, were they? said Tossie. Oh, no, it hadn't come to that yet, admitted Sal. For me own part, I think Miss Crummy was so haughty and offish with the poor man that he just up and quit. Tossie opened her eyes wide. She felt it a little hard to visualize the haughty, obstreperous Crummy. Both girls lifted their cups to their lips and took a deep drink. They each searched their minds for something startling to say. Their encounter seemed an unimportant occasion in their lives, and they were very unwilling to let it slide by and enjoy it to the full. Mr. Philip and Miss, Mrs. Philip be coming to tea this afternoon, announced Tazi. Mercy on us, cried Sally. And what is this letting to her ladyship be to say that Mr. Adling be coming to see she? Tossie had not the opportunity she had been waiting for. She had not seemed to impress her friend sufficiently with the fact of her intimacy with Lady Rachel. It was not very surprising that she should have confessed her trouble to Rachel. But surely it must startle Sal if she revealed that Lady Rachel had mentioned Mr. Etling to her. She finished her coca gravely, rose from her chair, prodded the potatoes with a fork, stirred the stew, and then, leaning across the table, smelt at the bluebells. Straightening herself up, she next glanced at the door. There she then she looked out the window. Still upon her feet, she stared significantly at Sally. Her expression said, There are no light matters. A thrush was singing in a labyrinth bush at the end of the little garden. A faint set of trodden grass from where the two cows were feeding floated in above the warm air along which that rich song. Both the girls felt a penetrating thrill of happiness. It was May Day, and the spirit of romance was abroad upon the air. He do write poetry, said Tossie in a low, awed voice. There be too much talk in this wood town about she and him. People be awfully careless the way they talk. Master said to Mrs. this morning, remarked Sally, that he be a true blood Saxon. Meaning he over to Middlezoy? asked Tossie, sliding down upon her chair. How teasing it was when a person didn't give a person the credit for things. Why didn't Sally, instead of toiling her, telling her what Mr. Garrett had said to Mrs. Garrett, cry out, 
Oh, Tossie Stickles, how wonder it, it is that Lady Rachel talks to ye so nice and natural. Master said to Mrs., continued Sally, that Atling be the eldest name around here. He said Zoyland were nothing to it. His folks be plain farmer folks, protested Tossie. Then, taking advantage of Sally's cup being in her lips, he do write poetry about she. She did tell you that, cried Sally, really astonished at last. Tossie was abashed. The truth was that it was she herself, and not Lady Rachel, who had referred to Mr. Adling. A little bird told I, she murmured evasively. Be Mr. Philip really coming to tea? said Sally, beginning to feel, as she listened to the thrush, that there was too many little birds in Benedict Street. One wanted more solid facts. It's not often, so people do say, that they, Elms, folks, go out together. There was extra orders given give for the flock rock cakes to Baker this morning, said Tossie firmly. It was Sally's turn now to bend forward and inhale the heavy bluebell fragrance. She tilted back the big straw brim of her hat and with her fingers as she did so. Be a going to hospital when your time comes, she murmured between her sniffs at the flowers. Maybe, said Tossie. Do they let you see Mr. Barter these days, her friend went on. Tossie's cheeks got red. What do I want with seeing a bloke that can keep company with the baggages at Pilgrim's? Lily Rogers told old Mrs. Robinson, remarked Sally, that Reza Smith were angling for Mr. Barter to marry she. Tossie's reply to this was more expressive than polite. She put out her tongue at her friend. Master all worked up this morning, said Sally, content to change the conversation now that she was made mention of Clarissa. Mr. Philip wrote to her to Turbolo's still stiff letter about his midsummer circus. He said he's got the police to stay a bit. Faint our mayor above all, they police and such like, pondered Tossie Stickles in a wasteful, wistful tone. A little bell above the dresser began to tickle, tinkle. Mrs. Went Summit, said the girl, setting up from her chair. Lady Rachel did not breathe a word to Miss Crow about the contents of the letter she had received, so the two ladies were waiting side by side in the little back garden. I've heard from Ned, she said quietly then, looking across the sweet pea sticks at her hostess. Yes, Rachel, replied Miss Crow. He's coming to tea this afternoon, said the young girl, if you'd let him. Why, my dear, that's as nice as it can be. You know I've only seen him that once when the mayor asked us to meet him. He doesn't expect to find anybody else here, said Rachel. Only my nephew and Tilly and Miss Crow planting her fork in the ground and resting her hand. Only my, <clears throat> only my nephew and Tilly, said Miss Crow, planting her fork fork in the ground and resting her hand in her rough gardening gloves upon its handle. The thrush had flown off into the next little garden, but from there its voice was still audible. The worm elves smell of the disturbed earth mound, but it smelled, too, of a more subtle odor than that. It smelled of an odor that comes voyaging across the water meadows from spinneys and corpus and withy beds and high upland and deep lanes and sequestered gullies and hidden combs and narrow hazel paths and mossy openings and old woods. The odor of Summershire itself. It is only certain days, days under unique conditions of the wind and the weather, that call out from the soil of a particular district that district's own native peculiar smell. And this bay day was precisely such an especial day. Had any traveler came back to Gladstonbury on the day, he would have been aware of in a second that it was one of those days when the spirit of this portion of the earth distills itself in a rare, unique essence. And of which is this voyaging mystery composed? Chiefly of the smell of primroses. Different from all other essences in the world, the smell of primroses has a sweetness that is faint and tembulous, and it possesses a sort of tragic intensity. 
There exists in this flower its soft petals, its cool, crinkled leaves, its pinkish stalk that breaks at the touch, something which seems able to pour its whole self into the scent it flings on the air. Other flowers have petals that are fragrant. The primrose is something more than that. The primrose throws its very life into the essence of itself, which travels upon the air. I feel like I just said that, but he says it twice. But the odor which floated now over that little garden at Benedict Street and hovered above Miss Crow, at, she looked at the proud timidity in those green gray eyes that faced it so subtly, at that light poised figure gripping so tightly the long hose she had been using, had yet another pervading element in it the scent of moss. Not a path of earth. In any of these prinnies and corpses and woody beds, withy beds that edge those water meadows, not a plank, not a post, and the sluices and weirs and gates of those wide moors, but had its own growth somewhere about it of moss, softer than sleep. More delicately, more intricately fashioned than any grasses of the field, more subtle in texture, than any seaweed of the sea, more thickly woven, and with a sort of intimate, passionate patience by the creative spirit within it, than any forest leaves of any lichen upon any tree trunk, the sacred moss of Somersetshire would remain as a perfectly satisfying symbol of life if all other vegetation were destroyed out of that country. There is a religious reticence in the nature of moss. It vaunts itself not. It proclaims not its beauty. Its infantile, infinite, infinite, not infantile, variety of minute shapes is not apprehended until you survey it with concentrated care. With a peculiar velvety green, a greenness that seems to spring up like a dark froth from the living skin pores of the Earth Mother. This primeval growth covers with its shadowy texture every rock and stone and fragrant of fragment of masonry, every tree root and ho hovel roof, roof and ancient boarding, over which the rain can sweep or the dew can fall. The magical softness of its presence gathers upon the margins of every human dream that dream in, in its background from life in the West Country. The memories of youth are full of it. The memories of old people who have gone to and fro in West Court Tree villages wear it like a dim, dark garment against the cold of the grave. And when the thoughts of the bedridden turn with piteous craving to the life outside their walls, it is upon deep rain-soaked wet moss, sprinkled with red toadstools, or with brown leaves, or with drifting gossamer or seed, that they most covetously brood. You know what to expect from my nephew, Rachel, because you've seen him already, went on Miss Crow. If he doesn't treat our young poet with proper respect, you and I will squash him. He's not hard to put down, as you've seen, when a woman stands up to him. Rachel shifted her hoe from one hand to the other, and, lifting her young head, inhaled the moss primrose odor upon those floating ears. She listened to the exultant trillings of the trush, thrush from the unseen bushes in the neighboring garden. You are very kind to me, Miss Crow, she said. Oh, and I've asked the victor, added the Miss Elizabeth apologetically. There, there's not a boy under heaven, however sensitive, who could mind him. He's an easy to manage as that queer, surly son of his you didn't like. Is difficult. But even poor old Sam is nice when you approach him in the right way. Well, I apologize for bundling, bum, bum, bungling, bumbling, bungling, buddling, boodling, some of those words. Sometimes it happens to me. It's a little hot in here, for one thing. Got the vapors. Well, until next time, I'll see you in good old Gladstonbury.
Cheers. <laughs>